May the 8th, 1862, and the Texas Brigade is just coming off their first taste of battle. A victory the day before at Eltham's Landing. The Brigade had suffered 40 casualties, including 15 killed. But there was no time to rest for the Texans. They were on the move again back towards Richmond. The Texans had not only proved that they could fight, but they were recognized publicly for their heroics from both President Jefferson Davis and Major General Gustavo Smith, who wrote that the Texans had won immortal honors for themselves, their state, and their commander. Three days later, on May the 11th, the brigade encamped under a grove of pine trees along the Mechanicsville Road about three miles from Richmond, a semi-permanent camp that they call Camp Pine Island. There, Colonel A.T. Rainey, commander of the 1st Texas, ordered the regiment to form under the colors. George A. Bernard was being promoted to color sergeant for the bravery he demonstrated during the Battle of Eltham's Landing, when after seeing the colors go down when Tom Nettles was wounded, George picked up the fallen colors and rallied the men. The brigade remained in camp until the 27th of May when they were called into action. The Battle of Seven Pines would be fought on May the 31st and June the 1st, but as Captain Tacitus Clay wrote to his wife back in Independence, Texas, they saw very little action. Clay also wrote that on May the 31st, Brigadier General Robert Hatton, commander of the Tennessee Brigade, was killed, and that Colonel James J. Archer, who'd been commanding the 5th Texas, and who the men had a dislike for, was promoted and given command of the Tennesseans. Lieutenant Colonel Jerome Robertson, who'd organized the Texas Aids, Company I, in Washington County, Texas, and was a friend of Clay's, was promoted to colonel and given command of the 5th Texas. The other casualty of the Battle of Seven Pines was General Joe Johnston, who was wounded by an exploding Union artillery shell and broke several ribs. Jefferson Davis, who'd had several run-ins with Johnston, assigned Robert E. Lee to take command of the Army in Northern Virginia. On June the 11th, the brigade received orders to join Stonewall Jackson in the Shenandoah Valley. In fact, Lee had devised a ruse to send the Texas Brigade and Whiting's Brigade to Stanton by train as a subterfuge to make Union spies believe he was reinforcing Jackson in order to attack Washington City. That would mean that Lincoln would have to hold troops back to defend the city, troops that couldn't reinforce McClellan. The brigade marched into Richmond and boarded the trains to Stanton, which they reached on June the 17th excited about the prospects of joining Jackson. They still had no idea where they were headed when they got orders to return to Richmond. In fact, Jackson, the Georgians, and the Texans had been ordered to Richmond to take part in the next attack against McClellan's Union forces, the Seven Days Battle. By June the 25th, the brigade was in Ashland, about 16 miles north of Richmond, and the next morning they took up the march again to Hunley's Corner, north of Mechanicsville. Lee planned to use Stonewall Jackson's force, along with the Texas Brigade, to attack the rear of Porter's Fifth Corps at Beaver Dam Creek, while Longstreet, A.P. Hill, and D.H. Hill attacked from Mechanicsville. But Jackson's delay in reaching the battlefield until late in the day meant that A.P. Hill attacked alone. After Porter's Federals held off the Confederate attacks at Beaver Dam Creek on the 26th of June, McClellan ordered Porter to fall back. McClellan's forces south of the Chickahominy were moving back towards the James River, and Porter was assigned as the rear guard. At dawn on June the 27th, Porter moved his corps to a new defensive position several miles southeast of a mill owned by William Gaines to a plateau on Boatswain's Creek. Porter placed his men on the high ground around the Watt and Adams farms in an arc, giving them an advantageous position, and they immediately started building impromptu abatis, using fallen trees and brush. 
We're at the Gaines Mill National Battlefield, and we're standing on a crest just about where the 83rd Pennsylvania must have been dug in, facing Boatswain's Creek, which runs along the north side of the battlefield on my right. Behind me in the distance is the Watts Farm, which was General Porter's headquarters. Union artillery was placed all along the ridge line, including Waterman's 18 guns, which were placed behind the farm on Turkey Hill. These fences represent the breastworks that the Union forces must have built as defensive positions against the Confederate attack. George McClellan had recently abandoned his supply route from White House and now had to move his wagons and cattle south. And he told Porter that it was imperative for him to hold this position until nightfall. Meanwhile, also on the morning of the 27th, when Lee saw that the Federals were moving south, he pushed his troops to pursue. He met with Jackson at 9.30 in the morning and gave him orders to march around the Federal right flank and capture a key crossroads called Old Cold Harbor. Lee would use Longstreet, A.P. Hill, and D.H. Hill to sweep down the Chickahominy. A.P. Hill was supposed to pursue the enemy as far as Gaines Mill and New Cold Harbor, while D.H. Hill took the Bethesda Church Road and joined Jackson. But A.P. Hill would attack the Federal Center at 2.30 in the afternoon and would be thrown back with heavy losses from artillery and musket fire. Longstreet saw how difficult it was going to be to attack across the boats and swamp and decided to wait for Jackson to arrive. But D.H. Hill attacked the Federal right and was repulsed in another piecemeal effort. Jackson would once again arrive late to the battle. His local guide had misunderstood Jackson and was taking him to New Cold Harbor instead of Old Cold Harbor. Once the firing started at Gaines Mill, Jackson realized they were on the wrong road, backtracked to the north and advanced down the right road, but the delay would put his 20,000 troops on the battlefield three hours late. With the leading elements of Jackson's column reaching the battlefield at 3 p.m., Lee ordered Ewell's three brigades to attack the Union Center and also directed Longstreet to attack the Federal left flank as a diversion. But both Ewell and Longstreet were repulsed. Because of the piecemeal nature of the attacks, even with a numerical advantage of 57,000 men to the Union's 34,000, Lee was still unable to break through. At this point, Lee made a decision that won the battle. He would use Hood's and Law's brigades as shock troops in one final desperate effort to break the enemy's center. At 4.30 in the afternoon, Lee rode out to find General Hood. He explained to Hood that unless the enemy's lines could be broken, the battle would be lost, and asked Hood, can you break the line? To which Hood replied, I will try. We're standing next to the Texas Monument at the Gaines Mill Battleground. We're on the other side of Boson's Creek, which is behind us. After Hood and Lee spoke on the afternoon of June the 27th, Hood formed his brigade in a line of battle, with Hampton's Legion on the left, the 5th Texas, the 1st Texas, the 18th Georgia, and the 4th Texas in reserve. Hood gave his men orders not to fire during the attack, not to break ranks, to give the first line of defense the bayonet, and when they fell back, to fire at the second line of defense. Hood checked his line, and at 7 p.m. the brigade advanced. John Bell Hood was very attached to the 4th Texas. That was his old regiment. And he made a promise. He goes, the next time the 4th Texas goes into battle, I'll lead the regiment myself. And he did. He led the regiment at Gaines Mill. He was under fire. And it's a miracle he didn't get wounded or killed. We're standing next to Boson's Creek, looking back towards the advancing Texas Brigade. During the advance, Hood had noticed an open area to the right of the 18th Georgia and moved the 4th Texas up to fill the gap. The Texans were walking over the bodies of the fallen men from A.P. Hill's earlier attack and men were still fleeing the front, urging the Texans not to go any farther or they'd be killed. Just on the other side of the creek, the brigade stopped. The lines were dressed, the order to fix bayonets was given, and with the order to charge, the Texas brigade attacked.
The Texans came out of Boson's Creek and gave the Union first line of defense the bayonet. It fell back on the second and broke. The Federals fell back in a rout with the Texans now firing and rarely missing their targets. At the top of the hill, the Union cannoneers stood by their guns bravely, but nothing could stop the inspired Texans. Hood had broken through. The 18th Georgia moved to the right and poured through the gap that the Texans had created, as did the 5th Texas and then the 1st. Soon the entire Confederate line was attacking and the Union 5th Corps was in retreat. The battle was won, but not without a heavy cost. Lieutenant Colonel Bradford Warwick of the 4th went down when he picked up the colors from one of the defeated regiments and shouted, Come on! Colonel John Marshall, who had replaced Hood as the commander of the 4th, was killed before the regiment reached the Union breastworks. In fact, all of the officers above the rank of captain in the 4th Texas were killed. And there's a lot of the, of the officers that were killed at Gaines Mill. John Marshall of the 4th Texas, who was uh, the commanding officer of the 4th Texas, he was killed at Gaines Mill because he was on his horse and he was leading the regiment and he was shot off his saddle. Val Giles writes later in his book that he was wounded and knocked out by grape shot before he could reach the crest of the hill, and a good Samaritan grabbed him by his collar and dragged him to safety behind an apple tree. Color Sergeant George Bernard of the 1st was also wounded. Carrying a massive flag, Bernard suffered a wound that left him lame in his left leg, but that didn't stop him. As he reached the Union abatis, Bernard threw the flag over the fell trees and crawled under them, picked up the flag, and waved it from the top of the Federal breastworks. Colonel A.T. Rainey, the commander of the 1st, was also severely wounded in the left hand and arm, and would later be sent back to Texas, never to serve again. Captain Tacitus Clay, the company commander of Company I of the 5th Texas, received two wounds during the attack. One wound to a leg, and the other bullet entering his side and lodged in his back. Taz was treated at a field hospital and then taken to a hospital in Richmond to recover. Hood. Hood. That night, as Hood rode over the battlefield looking for his dead and wounded, he heard his name being called over and over. He found Captain William P. Shambliss of the 5th U.S. Cavalry wounded on the field calling his name. Hood and Shambliss were friends, having served together at Fort Mason in Texas before the war. Shambliss and the 5th had counterattacked late in the evening, trying to reclaim the artillery pieces that the Texans had captured and were repulsed. Hood exchanged pleasantries and had Shambliss taken to the hospital and treated the same as his own men. The battle at Gaines Mill gave Robert E. Lee his first victory. But it came at a tremendous cost, with 1,483 killed and over 6,000 wounded. The Texas Brigade lost 89 killed and 476 wounded, most from the 4th Texas who led the charge. By 4 a.m., what was left of Porter's Corps had escaped across the Chickahominy River, burning the bridges behind them. The Union loss at Gaines Mill unnerved George McClellan and caused him to give up his attack on Richmond. The Confederate capital was safe. Second Manassas, or Second Bull Run, was fought a little less than a year after the Battle of First Manassas, or First Bull Run. Texas soldiers commented they didn't saw the skeletons of the battle from First Bull Run. The Texas Brigade was not in First Bull Run because there was a train wreck. They were on trains going to the battle, but there was a train wreck, so they missed the battle. Well, a little more than, a little less than a year later, they're almost at the same ground that the battle was fought on, first Manassas. And it was fought on August 29th and August 30th, 1862. Following the Confederate victory at Gaines Mill, McClellan's forces moved down the peninsula towards the James River with the intention of turning around and attacking Richmond. But after engagements at Savage's Station, Frazier's Farm, and Malvern Hill, McClellan and the Army of the Potomac moved to Harrison's Landing on the James River to rest and refit under the protection of the Union gunboats, ending what was known as the Seven Days Battles. The Battle of Gaines Mill had taken a heavy toll on the Texas Brigade, so they were ordered back to their old camp along the Mechanicsville Road just outside of Richmond, Camp Pine Island, 
where they would spend the next month also resting and refitting. During the brigade's stay in Richmond, Lieutenant Colonel Walter Botts of the 5th Texas, who'd been wounded at Seven Pines, resigned and returned to Houston to ultimately found what is now one of the most prestigious law firms in Texas, Baker Botts. Robert Campbell wrote that the men were not fond of Botts and no tears were shed for he was neither honored nor loved. Major John C. Upton was promoted and took Botts' place. On August the 13th, 1862, Hood, who was now commanding Whiting's division, received orders to join General Longstreet in Gordonsville. Robert E. Lee wanted to strike one part of the Union Army, John Pope, and George McClellan, their forces were split. McClellan was still on the peninsula, trying to boast that he could take Richmond. And John Pope's kind of defending Washington, D.C. And Pope and McClellan made some foolish boasts, like John Pope says, I can defeat any rebels that come against me. Well, that was not true. And Sega Manassas really proved that. About a week and a half before Sega Manassas, uh, there was a skirmish of Freeman's Ford, which was not far away. And so that was just a little preclude to the Battle of Sega Manassas. After the skirmish at Freeman's Ford on August the 22nd, Longstreet's Corps began its march towards Manassas, following Stonewall Jackson through the thoroughfare gap with the Texas Brigade in the lead. After an arduous march, on August the 28th, the Texans were ordered to secure thoroughfare gap using a cattle trail to the north of the gap, and the Federal artillery that was guarding the gap retired. Long before the gray dawn of the coming day was visible along the eastern horizon, the deep thunder of artillery was heard in the distance. The shrill bugles sang reveille, and by daylight, August 29, 1862, Longstreet's Corps was again in motion. Private Val Giles, Company B, 4th Texas Infantry. Hood's Texas Brigade was part of the battle on August 29th. Uh, there was some severe fighting. A lot of young men from the 1st Texas were killed. Uh, Private D.M. Walker from Navarro County, East Texas, was one of the casualties. He was only 16 years old. He was getting discharged because he was a young man and he was too young to fight in the battle. Well, he persuaded some officers that he just wanted to fight in one more battle so he could be with his friends. Well, unfortunately, Private Walker was shot and killed on August 29, 1862. It, a lot of the fighting was in the woods. Um, Colonel Philip Work was severely wounded and almost was captured in the woods at Sega Manassas on August 29th. He's very lucky he wasn't captured by Union forces, but he escaped just in time because uh, he was right next to him and it was very thick woods and they couldn't see very far in front of them or behind him. A day later, his Texas Brigade made, to me, their best charge of the Civil War. Um, during the late afternoon on August 30th, 1862, you had Hampton's Legion, South Carolina Legion, the 18th Georgia, the 1st, 4th, and 5th Texas, and they're all lined up in battle. Well, the 5th Texas, they were right in front of the 4th excuse me, the 5th and 10th New York Zouaves of um, Duryea's regiments. And these were the same soldiers that a little more than a year before were taunting the Texas soldiers at uh, the Potomac. Because the river was kind of narrow at some points. And so some of the soldiers from Duryea's regiment said, we heard you Texas are pretty tough. We're going to show you you're not. And the Texas just smiled and said, okay, well, you'll see. Well, Gaines Mill, the, the uh, Texans were up against the 5th and 10th New York and got them really good. Well, a couple months later at Seg Manassas, they faced them again. But this time it was a devastating charge against the Zolafs that they'll never forget. It was decimation on a grand scale. The 5th Texas was right in the woods 
about 100 yards away from soldiers of the 10th New York. You had the 10th New York, and then you had the 5th New York right behind them. And they weren't thinking that there was going to be any kind of charge. And all of a sudden, around 4 o'clock in the afternoon, they heard thousands of soldiers from Texas making the rebel yell and then charging, bayonet charge, right at the 10th New York. And they were shocked. The Zoas did not think there was anybody close to them. So the 5th Texas went up against the 10th New York and just ran right through them. However, the Texans did not go unscathed. The commanding officer of the 5th Texas, Colonel John C. Upton, was killed at the very beginning of the charge. He was on a horse. He took the 5th Texas flag, and right at the beginning when they made their charge, a grape shot shot him in the head and killed him right away. And that's very unfortunate. John C. Upton was quite a man. He was quite a character. He was very boisterous. He was brave. He was tenacious and had a quick temper. At the Battle of Gaines Mill, right before Sega Manassas, a squad of Union soldiers would surrendered. And a soldier of the, of the 5th Texas said, Sir, what should we do with these soldiers? He goes, release them and rather fight them than feed them. And so they were released. Also, on August 30th, right before the charge in the woods, a staff officer from James Longstreet goes up to Colonel Upton and says, do you need any guidance in battle, sir? Uh, are you all ready? And Colonel Upton did not like that question. He goes, our soldiers are ready. How dare you ask that question? Get out of here. Well, not long after, Colonel Upton was killed. And that was unfortunate for the 5th Texas. He was quite a man. But to the charge, the 5th Texas goes up against the 10th New York, goes right through him, and the 10th New York is running through the 5th New York's camp. And they're saying, run away, run away, we're getting massacred, we're getting charged upon. Well, the soldiers of the 5th New York, those that were ready to go up against the Texans, lined up in line and fired a volley at the 5th Texas. Well, the 5th New York were so panicked, they didn't realize that they were kind of in a ditch. They were kind of in a low place. And so when they fired their rifles, they fired too high. Well, the 5th New York, the 5th Texas did not fire too high. They hit their mark and devastated the 5th New York Zoas. I mean, devastated them. Within 20 minutes, hundreds of Zoas were lying dead or wounded on the field. A soldier from Texas looked at their bright uniforms because the Zoab uniform is very, very colorful. It has big, bright pantaloons or pants. They have a little fancy little jacket with embroidery and everything. Well, some of the soldiers from the 5th New York are going away from a stream or they're, going, they're crossing a stream and retreating and their pantaloons are filled with water, which is kind of a comical sight. Color Sergeant George A. Bernard of the 1st Texas almost lost his flag. He almost dropped it because he was laughing so hard, looking at these soldiers from the 5th New York trying to cross the stream and onto land with, a, with pants full of water. You know, it's, it's quite a comical sight, he said. What's sad is, is they found a little drummer boy after the charge, and they didn't know who he belonged to. He was the little mascot of the, of the 5th New York. One other story about Manassas, Sega Manassas, is the story of Lieutenant Mark Kearns, who ran a federal battery. And he was at his guns when everybody else in the battery was shot or ran away. He was the only one that stayed by the guns. And the 4th Texas got the battery. And the soldiers were very impressed by his brave conduct. And he's lying down next to the guns. And they said, let us take you to the hospital. You're in bad shape. And he goes, no, leave me. I told my soldiers and myself, I'm not going to leave my guns. Well, Lieutenant Colonel Benjamin F. Carter, who led a company against the Kearns battery, was so impressed with the young man that when he died, his, Lieutenant Colonel Carter's overcoat was over the body of Lieutenant Kearns. Less than a year later at Gettysburg, Lieutenant Colonel Carter is mortally wounded at the base of Little Round Top and he's captured on a wagon, ambulance wagon going back to Virginia. 
and he's at some house and the mother of Lieutenant Kearns heard about the loss of Colonel Carter, heard that he was wounded. So she went up with a friend of hers to the hospital and took care of Lieutenant Colonel Carter because she said Colonel Carter acted kindly on, on her son's last moments. So that was just a connection between Manassas and Gettysburg. The second Manassas, if Robert E. Lee would have had more troops, the gate, the gates to Washington, D.C. was wide open. If they had enough men, they could have taken Washington, D.C., in my opinion. Two weeks after the second Manassas, you had the Battle of Antietam or Sharpsburg, the bloodiest day of the Civil War. It was a hot day on September the 1st, 1862, and the roads dusty when the Texas Brigade began their march into Maryland. They'd spent the previous day burying their dead from the Battle of Second Manassas, and were now on the journey that General Lee hoped would end the war. Sharpsburg or the Battle of Antietam was fought on September 16th and 17th, 1862. Robert E. Lee wanted to invade the North. Him and President Jefferson Davis wanted to have a quick peace. Robert E. Lee said, well, let me invade Maryland and see if that would demoralize enough Union forces for them to surrender. He really thought the population of Maryland would be behind them a lot more than they were. He made it a point when Robert E. Lee had his Army of Northern Virginia go through villages and towns to play Maryland by Maryland, which is the same tune of Old Christmas Tree. He really thought the population would be behind the Army of Northern Virginia. A little were, but a lot weren't, and he didn't know that. He did not suspect that, and it was a shock. The Texas Brigade was on the move, but without the command of their general, John Bell Hood. During the fighting at 2nd Manassas, the brigade had captured several Union ambulances, which Hood divided among his regiments where they were badly needed. Brigadier General Nathaniel Evans, technically senior to Hood, ordered the ambulances turned over to his South Carolina brigade. Hood refused, and when Lee found out, had him arrested. So he was not at the head of his division when they moved into Maryland, but instead followed them at the rear. As the brigade was forced to make a retrograde march back from Hagerstown to Boonesboro, Maryland to reinforce D.H. Hill's troops who were coming under Union attack, Robert E. Lee sat on his horse traveler watching the procession. As the men passed Lee, they shouted out, Give us Hood! To which Lee doffed his hat and replied, You shall have him, gentlemen. After meeting with Hood, who was following at the rear, Lee suspended his arrest and he rejoined his troops. They would soon be fighting in the bloody battle at Sharpsburg. Some of the troops are there on September 16th. You know, some see action, but some weren't. The first Texas infantry was at was at uh, South Mountain, and that's not too far away from Harper's Ferry. They're part of uh, Stonewall Jackson's famous foot cavalry, and so they arrive in the morning of September 17th and finally they're able to have a breakfast, make biscuits and bacon because they were surviving off of green corn and green apples for days. So finally they had the chance on September 17th to cook bacon, get the cooks to make biscuits and enjoy a good hearty breakfast. Just as soon as they start cooking their bacon, they hear explosions, cannon, cannon fire and they know they have to go into battle. On the morning of September 17th, Lee doesn't really fully understand it or know what's going on, but he's in a bad situation. His back is up against the Potomac River. His enemy, George McClellan, has come up from the peninsula and faces him with a force that's at least two and a half times larger than Lee's and much better equipped and ready for a fight. And third, McClellan is at that lucky stroke of having found the orders that tell him where every piece of Lee's army is. The sort of thing every 19th century commander dreamed of. So Lee is pinned, he's outnumbered, and his enemy knows 
where his pieces are, what his plan is. So when the Union attacks begin that morning, Lee is in the position then of an outpunched, outweighed fighter, just simply up against the ropes fighting for survival. That's the situation when he turns to Hood's brigade and says, look, I've got a gap in the cornfield. I need y'all to go in there and hold the position. And that's what Lee's will tell Hood's brigade to do is to go into that cornfield and hold the position. It's not really a charge so much as just keep the Union Army. This would be up on the left flank of Lee's army from wrapping around Lee's much smaller force and overwhelming it. We're at the Sharpsburg-Antietam National Battleground, and behind me stands the Texas Monument, a testament to the indomitable spirit of the Hood's Texas Brigade. On the morning of the 17th of September, 1862, amidst the thundering cannons and billowing smoke, these brave Texans charged headlong into the inferno of Miller's cornfield, right here on this very soil. With unwavering resolve, they fought for the freedom and ideals they held dear. This monument stands as a tribute to their courage, a beacon of remembrance for generations to come. And so they go in, and in the first 20 minutes, we guesstimate that there were 2,000 casualties. Then 20 minutes, every leaf of that cornfield is gone. The first, fourth, and fifth are there, but the first takes the brunt of it. And we have those remarkable stories that can be backed up with evidence. We talk about a unit losing its coherence when it gets to 15 or 20% losses. The first Texas stood in that cornfield, took 82% losses, fired every round they had in their pockets, and stood there yelling cuss words, throwing rocks with fixed bayonets, and daring the Union troops, who outnumbered them about six to one, to come one more time. Sergeant Howard E. Perry, part of the Marshal Guards of the 1st Texas, who of course the King of Texas, was one of the casualties, and there's a photo of him, black and white photo of him, probably taken either in Austin or in Richmond at the beginning of the war with a big Texas Bowie knife. And this is a young man, and he had five brothers, five Perry brothers. Three of them never survived the war. Howard did not survive the Battle of Sharpsburg which is very tragic. A lot of young men were in the Hoods, Texas Brigade. People think of soldiers as being a little older. A lot of them are boys. A lot of them are boys. George A. Bernard of the 1st Texas was the flag bearer. He marched many miles in bare feet. His feet were bloody and scraped up. His commanding officer, Major Matt Dale, says, Sergeant Bernard, let me see your feet. And so he shows him his bare feet. He says, you're not going to battle. You, your feet are too bloody. You're too sore. Go to the hospital. That saved George Bernard's life. The first won its spurs, won its battle honors in the cornfield at Antietam. The fourth at Gaines Mill. The fifth at Second Manassas. The first in the cornfield. But they paid 82% in casualties and they lost their flag. The Union officer who picked up that flag, which was laying on the, on the ground, counted 11 dead Confederates who had died trying to defend and support that flag before he was able to reach it and just pick it up off the ground. It's, it's an overwhelming story. It's a story of what shouldn't have happened, but somehow the Texans made it happen. They shouldn't have held that cornfield, but they did. They shouldn't have been able to repulse three different Union Corps, but they did. And we historians, we can dissect it, and we'll talk about this is McClellan's fault. He's not a fighter who fights to win. He fights not to lose, so he wouldn't send all of his troops at the same time. They came in sequence, so the Confederates are able to shift and fight them off. But the bottom line is that they did fight them off against incredible odds, and not as many of them as you might think came back out of that cornfield. We, when we show these pictures many a time of veterans after the war who've lost a leg, who've lost a foot, a lot of times the punchline is at Antietam in the cornfield, 
for which taxes were gained. George Bernard made it absolutely the correct summary. He said the flag was not exactly captured. During the Civil War, if a Union soldier captures a Confederate flag, they get the Medal of Honor. Thomas Custer, George Armstrong Custer's brother, had two Medal of Honors because he captured two Confederate flags. Well, the soldier from Pennsylvania found the battle flag of the 1st Texas Infantry, and he got the Medal of Honor. The first Texas flag was given back to Texas in 1905 with the great exchange of flags. The U.S. government gave back their battle flags of the South to the southern states. Not only was the first Texas Lone Star battle flag captured, so was their Army of Northern Virginia battle flag. Both flags are now stored at the Texas State Archives in Austin. But if it wasn't for George Bernard's bloody feet, he never known about his exploits in Gettysburg and later other battles because he would have been dead. We're standing in front of the old Dunker Church. At nightfall on the 17th, the brigade moved back to the church to rest and reorganize. Later that evening, General Lee summoned his commanders to get their assessment of the day's battle. When he got to John Bell Hood, he asked, Great God, General Hood, where is the splendid division you had this morning? Hood answered, they're lying on the field where you sent them, sir. My division has been almost wiped out. Joseph B. Pauley of the 4th Texas later wrote, The Battle of Sharpsburg was fought with desperate courage by both the gray and the blue. And the 17th of September, 1862, stands out as the bloodiest day in American history. More men were killed and wounded that day than on any other day of the war. And I doubt if the dead and wounded ever lay thicker up on any field than was seen from the old Dunker Church. I hope you enjoyed this episode of Hood's Texas Brigade. And if you did, be sure and give us a thumbs up and subscribe to our channel.